gosh. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting on capitalism and the climate crisis and what I think is a really good solution, um, eco-socialism. Um, next slide. Yeah. So, oh, actually go back a slide. I'm sorry. I didn't start that right. Um, so I'll start off by reading my description because I've never really done a webinar before. So the description is, when we face the climate crisis, it's often, it's often with the all-consuming sense that we must save ourselves and the earth. But we have to think beyond that because the climate crisis did not occur by accident. It was caused by capitalism. Our current systems are inherently out of balance because striving for infinite growth on a planet with, infinite, um, with finite, finite resources is never sustainable. Our industries operate by making profit at the cost of environmental degradation and human exploitation. That's the standard. Um, so to combat the climate crisis, we must tackle the very capitalist mindset of infinite growth at the expense of human and environmental rights that brought us here. That's why we need um, system change, not climate change. So we'll be exploring alternatives to this lifestyle through discussing eco-socialism, the Green New Deal, and regenerative solutions we can learn from indigenous peoples. I also want to preface this with the fact that I am not a policy or political theory expert. I haven't even finished the book about eco-socialism I was supposed to read before this, um, but I made this with lots of help from people that know a lot more than me. Um, shout out to Jessica, who will be one of our panelists, and Lou from South Bay Indigenous Solidarity, as well as all of our panelists. And I'm just coming at this from like a common sense angle of a young person who's being radicalized and realizing that everything I've ever known and kind of grew up with is kind of a lie. And yeah, we got to get there at some point. Um, so this slide. Oh, actually, can you go back to the sign really quick? Sorry. Um, so have you seen the sign of the strike? I know I have, and I've wondered, oh, good. Yes. Why? But like, how? Well, I know you probably joined strikes for the excitement of the protests and activism, but I think COVID-19 has given us a really good opportunity to step back and ground ourselves in the knowledge of what we're fighting for and why. We might not be able to be physically protesting on the streets, but we should take this time to instead reflect on the changes that need to recur. And um, what we're fighting for is a huge reframing of our entire worldviews and lifestyles. It's massive change at a level never before seen. So let's start this talk with the realization that we need systemic change, not policies that merely deter emissions, because that's what climate justice ultimately means. Next slide. Um, so yeah, why do we need such drastic systemic change? Well, climate change did not happen by accident. We need systemic change because it's a systemic issue. If 100 companies, these are the 100 companies, names and locations, um, can create over 70% of the world's emissions, um, with the sheer scale of the climate crisis, it's too late for incremental changes to save us. Um, yeah, um, that goes, that comes to my point later, but yes, real progress will only occur because of big systemic reforms rather than individual actions. Rather, the focus on personal emissions has even been, been promoted by climate deniers in order to detract from the support for more impactful regulations. They want to put the onus of solving climate change onto the consumer. They want to burden the everyday person with the guilt of living a non-ultimately sustainable lifestyle without revealing the fact that our society is 100% dependent on, upon fossil fuels and unsustainable dirty infrastructure because they can go on polluting, spilling oil, fracking without regulation while us everyday people are worrying about like forgetting a reusable bag to buy groceries. And the fact that these companies are allowed to get away with this for so long, yeah, it's pretty much exactly this comic situation. We don't have a say. Not our goods, not our environments. Corporations will keep doing what corporations do because they get away with it. They can pay off legislators. They have the funds to pay off legislators and deregulate and make them more profits, which starts the cycle. They have all the power. Um, next slide. So, and that's part of the cycle that contributes to the nature of capitalism, which is systems of extraction. Its view of infinite growth at any cost comes at the cost of our environment. It comes, at, um, it comes with inhumane policies and exploitation at every level. If there, I think one thing I've learned that's common fact is if something's not shouting in your face, we're sustainable, we're free trade. It's definitely not sustainable or free trade because the industry standard is exploitation and sweatshops. So de constantly demanding growth and profit is inherently unsustainable on our um, finitely resourced planet because, you know, there's limits to what we can exploit the land and extract out of the land. And we don't live in an, inf an infinite place with that capacity. Um, so it's obvious that this 
their costs of, you know, profit, labor, exploitation are being externalized onto the environment and people that don't deserve um, to face the brunt of that. And companies ultimate beholdens is to their bottom line, um, never the common good or the people they claim to serve. Um, next slide. So here are some statistics. So yeah, again, 71% of the world's emissions are from 100 companies. The world's richest 10% produce half of global carbon emissions, while the poorest half contribute only 10%. Um, the world's wealthiest 16% use 80% of the planet's natural resources. So yes, um, capitalism is the cause of the climate crisis. Um, amongst so many other causes, it's all so super intertwined. All the societal ills that we talk about, you know, everything, extraction, colonialism, wars, genocide, racism, inequality, it's all inextricable from each other. And we could go into probably so many people that talk about it way better than me, but this is kind of just focused on um, climate right now. But inherently the system that prioritizes people to um, prioritizes profit over people, that will never lead to the public good. And um, capitalism makes the effects even worse because climate change exacerbates existing systemic issues. So as um, my earlier statistic about like 10%, the richest 10% producing half while the poorest half produce 10%, that's the climate crisis is central injustice because the poor um, are responsible for only a tiny share of humanity's greenhouse gas emissions. Think like third world countries, unindustrialized countries, developing countries. Um, they suffer first and worst from all the heat waves, drought, storms, rising seas, and the actual effects of the rich making those emissions. Um, countries in Asia, Africa, and South Africa that endure like centuries of colonization still remain relatively poor today. And while all the while their resources are being extracted by richer countries to um, take our, to, to make profit. And then um, even countries like India and China whose prosperity is increasing much less per capita than do the rich countries in New York, um, North America and Europe. They, like that's per person. It's our lifestyles in America, accustomed to wealth and luxury built off the backs of the exploitation of the global South. And that's the one place where I feel like personal action makes a difference because it's our lifestyles here, but there's also systemic action in play. Um, so yeah, as, in, as always in every crisis, there might be extreme weather striking all of the world, like the coronavirus right now, it's striking all of the world, but the rich are so much better off. There's so much inequality based in the testing, in the relief measures, you know, and you, the rich are so much better off. They can withstand those impacts. They can afford seawalls, satellites, um, disaster. Um, and when disaster strikes, non-white and non-affluent communities are shortchanged during relief efforts. We see that happening right now, but here's a case study from Hurricane Katrina. Next slide. <laughs> Um, so basically, um, when they were doing relief efforts after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans in 2005, Black homeowners, homeowners received 8,000 less per family in government resettlement aid than did white homeowners, which helps explain e why even eight years after the storm, roughly 80% of the mostly Black residents of the city's Lower Ninth Ward had not returned. And that's how every natural disaster ends. And how many are going to happen because of the climate crisis we've set into motion? You know, all the low income communities of color that will be left behind because they don't have enough social cap capital, which is political leverage or fiscal capital. That's literally their money in a society that prioritizes the rich. And um, that's where cl class consciousness comes into environmental disasters as well. And we see that super glaringly in our next case study, um, Flint, Michigan. It's why we need environmental justice and climate justice, not just a perfunctory de de decrease in emissions. The reality is that environmental racism is real and absolutely de detrimental because the systems in place today already dispor disproportionately leave marginalized, low-income communities of color out. That is systemic racism at play. Access to clean water and air is a human right, but our system so discriminates. In 2014, the system's unelected emergency manager switched the city's water source from the Detroit system to the long-polluted Flint River in an attempt to save money. Flint's population is 56.6% African America, um, African American per the 2010 census. They're left with polluted, dirty, unsafe water supply causing multitudes of health issues. And they still don't have completely safe water today as they're still stuck with lead pipes. So Flint, Michigan's 
water crisis was a result of systemic racism. And one can easily see how the systemic racism will translate to the response of any natural disasters or public health issues because the climate crisis is a public health issue. Study after study has shown that people of color and those living in poverty are exposed to higher levels of environmental um, pollution and suffer greater health problems. More than half of the residents within two miles of toxic waste facilities in the US are people of color, according to a study by the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, building off of that on our next slide, um, a case study is Eurostack. So Eurostack, it's, a, um, it's land that lies at the heart of the ancestral line, lands of the Amamutsin tribal band near Gilroy at the southern edge of Santa Clara County. Um, for thousands of years, Mutsin ancestors lived and held sacred ceremonies here. So, um, and also an investor group based in San Diego purchased the land and they're currently seeking to develop um, an open pit sand, gravel, sand and gravel mining operation on the property. So indigenous, indigenous peoples have suffered even more under the systems of capitalism, colonialism, and centuries of oppression and genocide. And this is a local example. Um, it's being threatened by private investors. And once again, extraction takes priority over indigenous people's sacred culture. In the words of um, the DSA Santa Cruz resolution, um, the proposed Sergeant Quarry would re represent a continuation of a pattern of economic development rooted in a colonial system in which um, communally managed indigenous land was first taken over by private investors, then exploited in such a way that a very small number of non-indigenous people profited immensely while leaving a ravaged environment um, that local denizens have to manage. In the process, human and ec ecological links to the past and prospects um, for a continued healthy future are destroyed. Um, on that note, we have a whole national webinar about Protect Eurostat coming next week, as well as a, um, a webinar about Indigenous, well, an interview with two members, three members of the Amamutsin tribe happening tomorrow. So um, we'll plug that at the end, but we'll elaborate much more then. Um, so sign their petition if possible. It's on our social medias because this is like an actual action step you can take because there's a huge um, environmental draft report coming out this summer and we need as many letters of opposition from the community as possible to make sure that, um, you know, that Sergeant Corey doesn't happen. Um, next slide. So it is systemic change or bust. Um, we, by systemic change, I mean dismantling capitalism. By bust, I mean a world in which global warming gets easily above four degrees Celsius and we all face climate catastrophe of proportions never seen before, straight out of like those sci-fi movies and apocalypse movies where we eat bugs and our population is like 10% of what it used to be. That latter scenario is absolutely happen happening. It's what we're on the trajectory for under our current system, which is why we need such huge change. And I think um, the biggest lie that we have to, that we believe is that it has to be this way, that this is the only system that work, that works. That's capitalism at work, brainwashing us into believing it and suffering under it. Complacency, like believing that this is the only system that works ever, because that's not true, you know? Um, people have lived for thousands of years without prioritizing profits over everything else. In all the very things people are criticizing about, you know, other forms of living, politics, um, oh, what does bust mean to you? It was my, um, apocalypse description right there. Or I guess, I guess it's not a great word for bust, but more like all the systemic, like, if we don't have systemic change, we get that apocalypse scenario. Yeah, pretty much die. But like all the other, besides ourselves dying, it's also like the entire world dying. And I'm, I'm sure the earth will recover in like millennia, but like our race won't, the current life won't, none of this will survive that. Cause the earth is a hunk of rock. It'll, it'll survive this, but we won't. So yeah, continuing. Um, so all the very things people criticize about socialism, other political theories have literally been revealed to be a part of capitalism with this COVID crisis, except the ruling class are privileged the fact that you know it's externalized onto the global south and people places we don't have to look at every day you know it hit it really well before and i think what was different about the 1970 earth day protests is that you could literally see like suit in the sky and like it was the sky was filled with pollution and it was really obvious like we can't stand for this but now they've cleaned it up to the point where only the poor communities the marginalized communities global south are feeling the effects and most of us 
you know, it's like the COVID crisis again. Like we're going to wait until it's way too late once the effects are manifesting in our relatively privileged and sheltered areas. Like once those effects are here, you know, we are screwed. Um, so yeah, the biggest lie we believe is that capitalism is normal because it isn't. And we are rapidly learning that a society that couldn't care less about its people unless they produce profitable later, labor is absolutely unsustainable and unacceptable when this is the defining issue of our time. Um, yeah, we are facing the single greatest crisis of our time and the time to act was, to use um, my colleague Jamie Minden's words, the time to act was yesterday. And I can read out all the terrifying statistics about climate change, it's an emergency, but I'm guessing since you're here, you know all about it right now. We've got no time. And this unsustainable system, we have it has to go. So, oh, thank you for changing the slide. So what is eco-socialism? Well, like I've been pretty much describing this entire um, webinar, eco-socialists believe environmental degradation and social injustice stem from the same source, a, pro a world where profit is the highest goal, essentially capitalism. Um, yeah, so we recognize that capitalism is the cause and we need regenerative circular solutions to solve it. Um, yeah, and we can and we need to envision a system beyond capitalism in which production is driven by human need and the common good. So, yeah, this is the solution I'm talking about. Um, a circular economy, a just transition, prioritizing marginalized peoples, and um, keeping things like, like disposable plastics out of our lifestyle. And I think it can be easily, we just have to change our entire consumerist lifestyle. And it's going to be really, really, really hard. But we can't keep being fine with the intense amounts of pollution that are happening in the physical manifestations because you can't see carbon emissions or feel them, but there are literally like so much, there's so much trash in this world and we can actually feel that with our own fingers. And I don't, I, I guess like the landfill was always my worst nightmare as a kid. Like I would just like, I'd think about all the gross tissues and like all the gross things we put into the garbage and that's all built up in a landfill in, and, and then we just, our society is like, like that's okay. Like that all of our things aren't gonna decompose for thousands of years and that's okay. Like I don't think that's okay and I don't have a really good solution for it yet, but I think we need to work together to make sure that that's not what we do keep going forward. Our production needs to prioritize regenerative solutions. So I'm gonna go to the Green New Deal. Oh, actually keep, let's keep on talking about regenerative solutions. Sorry, I'm lost. So, um. Canyon, who is one of our panelists, can speak on this more after I do a brief overview. But um, what's the solution with things like Protect Eurostock? Well, regenerative wisdom from, or in land in general. So we need wisdom from indigen indigenous tribes who prioritize active land stewardship, living in harmony with it instead of exploiting it for resources and profit. Um, they've, they've been living on land, these lands for thousands of years without a climate crisis happening. I think they know much better than us. They prioritize the importance of maintaining the land as sacred and having a good relationship with all living and non-living things, treating them with love, patience, and gentleness. So this is another example of how capitalism has ruined our mindsets to the point where we, the default is extracting and exploiting the earth instead of treating the world around us with respect. Um, yeah, next slide. We'll be going to the Green New Deal. Pretend I put like a label there. Um, can we play this, please? Um, oh shoot, is the volume not working? Hmm. Started making this commute. Okay, never mind. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it, but people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. 
Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing, and it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people. And most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. 
But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Okay, um, so that is AOC's kind of, I guess, whole introduction to the Green New Deal. And um, this is a slide I borrowed from Sunrise Movement, actually. They're this um, political organization full of young people. Yeah, I agree, Jessica, it's so beautiful. I really, I think I like shed a tear the first time I watched it. Um, that was back in 2018 or 2019, I think. So, um, so from Sunrise Movement, who's, who are an org of young people um, fighting for the Green New Deal at every level. They're, they phone bank for candidates, down ballot races. Um, they do all sorts of really cool things surrounding climate organizing and um, they've got a really, a lot of really good resources. So I borrowed this slide from them. Um, so the pillars are stopping the climate crisis through a 10 year nationwide mobilization, like at the rate of, you know, World War II or even greater because the climate crisis is the greatest like war of our time, creating millions of good jobs, which we need more than ever and establishing a second bill of rights and defending the dignity of all people. Um, next slide. So this is a quote, the Green New Deal is the only plan put forward to address the interwoven crises of climate catastrophe economic inequality and racism at the scale that science and justice demand. So um, that is a little bit about the Green New Deal. Um, from this overall presentation, does anyone have any you know, takeaways that you wanna share in the chat? Or if you um, want to raise your hands, um, nice Justin Bieber quote. Um, if you wanna raise your hands, I think we can allow you to like say something out loud too. Um, second Bill of Rights, you can find more information on like the Sunrise Movement's, hmm, let me see if I can share slides here, but um, I actually highly recommend Sunrise School. If you like these teach-ins that we're doing, Sunrise School has a lot of teach-ins on all the basics of the Green New Deal. They teach you pretty much, um, yeah, it's a really good resource for uh, so many really cool trainings and getting involved in this kind of stuff and educating yourself about climate organizing. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, I think I am going to butcher your name, Nassim. Um, yes, it must include a drastic cut in military spending. I think the U.S. military is like the number one polluter in our world right now. And Congress keeps writing blank checks to them to do whatever they want. And it's not okay. We need blank checks for climate, not for war and violence. Um, any other takeaways, everyone? Don't be shy human geography class. Maybe I should take a human geography class. I've never gotten that opportunity, but elaborate, elaborate. Olivia, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, the Department of Defense. There are big polluters amongst other evils, I think, for sure. Um, yeah, and feel free to check out Canyon's um, website for educational resources. And okay. Um, yeah, I guess we've got a lot of human geography. I I really have to take one of those classes, I think, because like all my education has come from like the internet and Sunrise Movement and the people around me. And I think it would be really cool to take a class about this kind of stuff because people probably know a lot more than me, but this is kind of just an introduction. Ooh, I think that the Green Party policy, that's a good policy demilitarization definitely and what what's going on with the oil right now like negative like 
that is not the future. I don't know why not everyone's divesting right now. But today is the day of divestment in Earth Day Live. So, you know, get involved. Look, look up your local 350 org. Probably if you're here at Silicon Valley, um, look them up. Look up the words divestment 350. And they have lots of cool divestment actions. And JP Morgan Chase actually is like the hugest funder. Um, okay, well, I think our takeaways is then let's get to the panel because people know um, much more than me. So let's go for an introduction. That's me, you can skip past me. <laughs> um, Christine, if you wanna say a couple words. Yes, agreed, Tanvi. Hmm. Well, I wish I could respond to all of these. Christine, if you, oh, how do I promote? Yes, can, can you hear me all? Yes, I can hear you. I can't see you though. You should turn on your. Yes. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you, you want me to say a few words about myself? Um, yeah, or people can read your slide if we think we don't have enough time, but you can go for it. Okay. Right, so as you can see just quickly, yes, I'm a telecommunications engineer. Um, I'm originally from France, as you can hear with my accent, <laughs> and in Canada. I've been living in California for about 20, over 20 years now. Um, I'm also a climate and social justice activist. Um, actually, I've been advocating for peace and human rights pretty much, you know, a big portion of my adult life. And, um, and about four or five years ago, following the campaign of defenders, I decided to have a bigger impact by registering green and becoming an organizing member of the green party of california which is by the way the only national eco-socialist party and the only corporate free party in the u.s <laughs> so um so my values and activism align with the green party platform and uh, which also offer um uh, their version of a green new deal um, which is a strong version of a Green New Deal and, and includes policies, you know, social policies like Medicare for All, affordable housing, uh, free tuition, college and uh, education and so on and so forth. So, um, right. So I'm, I'm a council member of the Green Party of Santa Clara County. I'm also involved at the state level, Green Party of California, and um, I'm um, and I agree with you, Helen, quickly, just that all the, the, the crisis of the environmental crisis, the social crisis, the economic crisis must be addressed together, right? Which is what the Green New Deal is trying to do. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for that intro. Um, and our next panelist is um, Alex Lee. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Alex Lee. I am a Democratic candidate for Assembly District 25 in the South Bay and East Bay. But prior to that, I worked uh, working on policy advising in the State Senate and the State Assembly. So I did work on legislation on bills like on housing and education, environment, and those are also things that are important to my campaign. And what I'll hopefully be doing in office, uh, things like curbing climate change. As you probably know, California out of the 50 states is one of the leading states when it comes to fighting climate change. Unfortunately, it's not enough still, but we're, you know, it's kind of a low bar, but we are leading in that regard. And I hope to be pushing more things like a California Green New Deal too, when it comes to it. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Madeline, would you like to in introduce yourself? Hey everybody, um, I'm Madeline. The pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, so right now I live in Fresno, California, and I am an environmental justice organizer with an organization called Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. So basically what our organization does is we work with communities here in the valley um, that are like disproportionately pollution burdened and on the front lines of climate change. Um, and we work with those communities to organize and also on like local, regional and um, state level policy issues around air quality and water quality and housing access and conditions and transportation and land use, um, recognizing that like all of those things work together um, to form like the realities of the communities that we're living in. And those are a lot of the decisions that get made um, that end up affecting our environment. Um, but another thing I think is really important to like climate work is really recognizing as is the theme of this um, teach-in today, 
the interaction between capitalism and the climate crisis. Um, and so before I worked here in Fresno, I worked in Tennessee and across the Southeast doing more like labor side organizing um, and like litigation on behalf of farm workers um, in the Southeast. And I think that my experiences there um, you know, working with people who are being highly exploited and um, trafficked in the United States, like through a visa program that really like creates a captive labor force for basically what are still plantations. Um, you know, seeing that and then seeing here, like working in farm worker communities on the environmental side, it's really important to me that our climate um, activism, like incorporate the labor piece and the environmental piece because they're so intricately tied. So um, that's a little bit about me and like why I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Um, Canyon, would you like to go next? Thank you. Mishmin Tuhis, Countercott Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. <laughs> Hi, my name is Canyon Coyote Woman. I come from Indian Canyon Nation. I identify as a California native, um, two-spirited individual. My pronouns are she, they, and coyote. I am Mutsun Ohlone. Um, Ohlone territory is right here in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Did you know that Ohlone is a misnomer? And that is due to colonization. Uh, I am the co-founder of Canyon Consulting LLC, a consultation um, business dedicated to bridging the gap between indigenous and contemporary value systems. As the daughter of tribal elder Anne Marie Sayers of Indian Canyon Moots and Band, I live on the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara. And with that responsibility, my mother and myself have opened up the land for all indigenous people in need of land for ceremony and as, as well as for education. So traditional land stewardship, intertribal ceremonies and gatherings. So a lot of the work that I do in when I am interfacing with the public is reminding them how we can honor truth and history given that we as a society have not been given all the information, any decision that we come to currently is not informed. And we need to honor these elements that have been negated and forgotten. And so I, I am a, an extreme advocate for bringing this information to every conversation from anyone who's talking about climate, environmentalism, educating third and fourth graders, especially around California and that mission curriculum, which was very one-sided, and any circle I could get into, anything about water rights, protecting sacred sites, archeologically sensitive sites, all of these topics are all intertwined. So I'm glad to be a part of this conversation. I wanna say thank you very much. And when it comes to this work, it's taking steps towards honoring native land, honoring the layered truth and his the layers of truth and history, because there's so much that we can learn from each other, celebrating, cultural diversity, celebrating and respecting how diverse and unique our communities are and those truths that come with those values instead of saying this melting pot is the way to be. No, no, we need to be happy, diverse, toss salad and appreciate each other's whole cultures and truths about these things. So um, thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, we, we might not have su super much time for a Q&A, but that was already really insightful with just an introduction. Pedro, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, and I, <laughs> I didn't know it would look so wordy on the, <laughs> on the presentation, but my name is um, Pedro Hernandez. Uh, I'm also based in, in Fresno, California, beautiful Fresno, California. And I um, work with Audubon, California, which is a national um, conservation organization um, focusing on habitat restoration and um, wildlife protection, but I lead our statewide, um, local and federal climate policy advocacy efforts as well. Um, and I'm also one of the hub coordinators for the Fresno Sunrise Movement, which again is a, is a huge proponent for the Green New Deal and, um, you know, just transition from fossil fuels, because I think something that, um, I've noticed in, in, in my work working both in environmental justice and a more um, traditional conservation world is that these two spaces are often divided 
but really issues like capitalism and um, climate change are issues that don't res don't respect like social boundaries or what have you and it's really an issue that is affecting everyone so a lot of my work is trying to build a united front um, in the advocacy sector and build like long-term people-based power to um, immediately um, and effectively address you know the oppression from the fossil fuel industry and um, capitalist um, ruling class as well um, but yeah I'm I, a lot of my work has been based in the central San Joaquin Valley where um, the, we're living in a habitat that's been fundamentally altered by agro, um, the agro industry, by fossil fuel industry, by sprawling cities. Um, and also we experience some of the worst um, air pollution. We, the Central Valley has some of the worst um, rates of heat related mortality as well. And a lot of loss of biodiversity. So the Central Valley, I mean, there's tons of hotspots throughout the state and the country, but definitely Central Valley is one of those as well. So, um, you know, I, I was born here, I moved out, I lived in the, in the beautiful Bay Area as well, but I came back, um, you know, to, to work in, the, in my community and to like always, you know, I'd always wanted someone um, to like help my mom on these issues and like help like my, my community and my friends. And so I'm trying to fill the gap that, you know, I never saw when, when I was younger um, as well. So um, thank you everyone. And I will kind of save my time um, for the remainder of the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, who is our next? Sorry, I don't remember the number of the slides. Okay, awesome. Jake, um, you're up. Hey, Helen, thank you for having me. Wonderful job. Um, my name is Jake Tonkel, pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a candidate for San Jose City Council. I formally jumped headfirst into the divestment movement after returning home from uh, two and a half years in Morocco with the Peace Corps, uh, working on specifically uh, international development and youth education, um, how to frame it in an environmental lens and you know in a globalized lens where we take the understanding that the Western world is not supposed to um, push views onto other countries that are moving forward and trying to create their, you know, their own culture and their own way of living uh, and be able to take some of that home. And it's what I'm excited to do as a candidate is really highlight the fact that there are specific steps that we can take in our community um, to both highlight the injustices that are local, that many people you know, of privilege tend to push onto you know, places that are far away and be able to start conversations, start policy that, that has a, a meaningful impact on the lives of our community as well as a global perspective. Um, that's about it. So I'll, I'll leave it to the questions. Awesome. And I think our next um, panelist is Jessica. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, so my name is Jessica Matthew. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I kind of basically said it all on the slide. Um, I also, so I'm the main, my main thing is I'm the co-chair of the Eco-Socialist Working Group in Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and that's where I've done a lot of my organizing, um, where I've also um, helped educate folks about eco-socialism and about the Green New Deal as well. Um, because that is um, one of the important tools that we can use to create an eco-socialist um, future um, by uh, fighting for the Green New Deal. Um, and in its nature, it's pretty eco-socialist to begin with. Um, I also really loved, uh, I just want to give one little takeaway from the video. I really loved that um, AmeriCorps uh, was mentioned as one of the, uh, uh, one of the ways that the person who eventually ran for AOC's seat uh, learned uh, about environmental issues and how uh, she can help solve them um, because that is literally what happened for me. Um, I was an AmeriCorps myself uh, and so learned a lot about um, the environment uh, from that work and also about how to uh, be somebody who can uh, uh, help fight for, for the people in my community uh, as well. So. Uh, I hope that that's a part of the solution. Uh, that isn't something that's talked about as much, so I was just really happy to see that. Um, I hadn't watched that video before. Um, but yeah, I will uh, leave the rest of the time for questions. Uh, I won't take up any more time, but I'm just really honored to be on a panel with all these amazing people. So thank you. 
Yeah, um, thank you. I think I'll start the q and I did include a couple good Naomi Klein quotes, but we'll just start with the Q&A. Um, ooh, okay, so let's start with Lou's question to Canyon. Um, how can indigenous, ooh, is anything showing up? Sorry about that. But Canyon, um, how can indigenous decision-making power over indigenous cultural burial and sacred sites help stop environmental da damage, e.g the highway 101 corridor and i do have to time all answers because we don't have much time but keep it around a minute or a little more if so thank you well when it comes to indigenous-led movements and efforts it one needs indigenous leadership the considerations of indigenous peoples and how their land is impacted so having native people involved from the beginning many times with uh, many of these pr practices environmental racism and the impact reports that are created around these projects tend to ask the indigenous people later on saying oh we learned that this might impact your area are you concerned or do you have anything to say and they've already made the blueprint they've made the plans they've already gotten the permits and we need people to consider before we start doing this how is this going to impact not only ourselves, our environment, but seven generations in the future? And sometimes it means saying no. And so when it comes to protecting sacred corridors, more public outreach and education for the populace to understand that these sacred sites are not just, many people have a dissociated, dissociative uh, approach to this information. They say, I don't care, the economy matters more, money matters more, because there is no empathy. There is a lack of knowledge and understanding how living, how we as humans have a responsibility to steward and to be respectful to these sacred living systems. So it's public outreach, it's education, it's a shift in the parameters of what is, how we're being informed. And it means inclusive ongoing efforts and endeavors. So learning about the native peoples of the land that you're on, connecting with the active native communities. There are like three bands of Mutsun communities right there in the South Bay. There's um, quite a few, there's three groups up in Oakland. So I mean, people don't even know we exist and then they don't even know the current issues. So honor truth and history. So that's Thank my you. Question. Thank you for that, um, for sure. And I think someone's gonna drop the nativeland.ca um, thing in the chat. So next question from Nassim. Um, everyone can answer this if they want, but I think um, Madeline got dibs. How do you see local government's role in pushing for um, policies that dismantle capitalist institutions? So I feel like this is really similar to the work that I do like on the clock for my job at Leadership Council because we're just trying to, I guess sort of similar to what um, Canyon shared, like trying to encourage like the government um, and different developers of projects to like actually include the community that has a firsthand stake in that project and the effects it will have like in the process like from the beginning like before bad thing happens not just like as an afterthought to like check your boxes on your EIR um, but I mean I think that one of the things that comes to mind in response to that question is there's this podcast that I love and talk about a lot called Seen on Radio. And they're doing this series right now called The Land That Never Has Been Yet, talking about like the project of the United States and how like supposedly that was a democracy, but like we've never truly had a democracy. Um, and like one of the things that they pointed out was that, you know, the like colonizers and quote unquote founding fathers who like started this country, they explicitly said like, we want more capitalism and more capitalism means less democracy. So like they knew and admitted that more capitalism was going to mean less democracy and chose more capitalism. And so I think that the work of involving communities um, in decisions about their communities is you know, democracy, and that's going to go like against capitalism because more democracy is going to mean less capitalism. Totally. Thank you so much for speaking to that. Um, I definitely agree. It's like we have to wake up and get communities involved in actual democracy, not oligarchy, in um, making sure everyone's actively participating. Um, does anyone else want to speak to the role of local governments in policy? Sure. I can I can mention a few words to Helen. Yeah, I think I, I agree what Mad, what Madeline was was saying definitely. And also I think 
One of the things that local governments can push for is, for instance, and it was mentioned in the chat as well, is, is push for a public bank that will really serve the interests of the community and also organize to have a real uh, worker ownership of the means of production, right? Which is exactly what also eco-socialism is about. <laughs> so develop more co-ops, create, uh, as I said, a public bank at the state or municipal level, um, and also enact energy democracy based on, you know, community owned um, energy plans. So it, basically all the energy system, electricity grid uh, needs to be owned by the public, it needs to be public, right? Um, and also invest in renewable energy at the local level. I think each, you know, city council can do more in terms of divestment and investment in re renewable energy and also encourage, I think, the communities to consume less, right? And, and, and try to reuse more. So that could be done. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we'll definitely be going over our time slot because we have a lot of questions left and amazing um, panelists that wanna be able to speak. So um, uh, if anyone, I think we'll move on to the next question from Olivia Mock. Why is it difficult to create change from bottom up as opposed to top down? Well, I can start with the easiest way to answer that, which is money. Um, <laughs> that's, um, yeah, the money is all at the top right now. Um, and we're even seeing that, with, which I know you guys are going to have a whole separate teach in on uh, the climate crisis and COVID-19, but we're even seeing that with like the response and how people are able to handle COVID-19 um, with the, the ones who have more money are faring better. Um, and who are, are able to get tests and like, yeah. So um, that kind of is what it all comes back to is the way our system is designed um, is that all of our money, all of the, you know, profits of our labor go directly to the top right now. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest issues. So that's the easiest way to answer that anyway. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, before Jake um, has to leave, I'd like to ask him a question because he has to leave at one. Um, and I think this is from Nassim. What do you see as the role of local representatives when you're running for office? And how do you plan to fight for systemic changes? Appreciate the question. It's, uh, it starts on the campaign trail, right? When people start to pay attention in how local races are run, you realize that there's this term called five of five voter, right? Someone who has consistently voted time and time again. And it, again, has a space of privilege, generally homeowner, more wealthy, people that are able to pay uh, attention to how local politics impacts them. And then candidates shift their focus because there is time that's limited in order to only talk to those five of five or four of five voters. So I think what's something is really important uh, as a candidate is how do you reach other voices? How do you do that from the get-go and realize that that's more important than winning uh, because you're going to build your community-based capacity in that way. The, on the other hand of it, it's certainly about money and politics. You know, once you get into office, people that are elected that don't take money from super PACs, from corporations, from the industries that are exploiting people you know, locally and across the globe, um, then you can start to make those policy transitions, pushing for, like AOC said in the video, publicly funded elections, right? We don't need to wait to 2028 to have our first round of publicly funded elections. There are cities that have it implemented now, right? Um, Christine had mentioned a public bank. There's lots of policy that can happen at a local level where if I get 200 emails as a, a representative for San Jose City Council District 6, that is a huge you know, shakeup from a traditional we, um, showing that our community, when organized well for causes that put people over profit, can have a huge impact. So, thank you all for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry I have to jump off a little early. Thank you for um, staying till one and um, answering that great um, question. And we'll be providing a follow-up email with all your information. Um, thank you for coming and all your time. Thanks. Okay. Um, does anyone want to answer the question, what are some of the strategies um, newly elected officials can employ to steer the government, which is so entrenched in anti-environment, towards environmental justice? Uh, 
I, I'll take that one. Okay. Awesome. Hey, yeah. So uh, hopefully I'm going to be a newly elected in the state legislature in California. And as I mentioned, you know, California has made a lot of great inroads at getting to sustainable practices. We passed the 100% renewable energy by 20, I think 2040 at this point, which is obviously really late, but that's, that tells you kind of the environment that we operate in, right? Right now, it's really about compromising with, unfortunately, even in democratic state, compromising with the fossil fuel industry, with big corporate profits uh, that want to profit off of these things are harmful to, to society and the environment. So the problem right now is, so I personally am coming in as a new member who does not take any corporate money, does not take fossil fuel money, but I have to make sure that is the practice, right, amongst all my Democratic colleagues. It's not the standard practice amongst the Democratic Party in California or the country, right? So my thing, and I think Jake would share the same, same sentiment if you're still on, is that we don't support any people that do take it. You know who, who are influenced by the fossil fuel or corporations we won't be supporting those people and making sure that we can reform the movement of the left from the inside and within power and it's going to take a lot of help from activists like yourself right people on here who really care about changing from the bottom up because it's not just people who are in office who wield power quote unquote and think themselves that way right because for too long we've had politicians who think of themselves as an ivory tower sort of situation and they uh, you know, they, they make changes from down, from up to down, right? And that's not the way it should be. So, you know, I'm part of a movement which is inspired by a lot of great campaigns like the Sanders campaign in 2016. Uh, and we're going to be bringing more and more people into the fold to make sure we can have aggressive climate change uh, policies. Right now in California, there is a debated uh, uh, kind of skeleton bill right now for the California Green New Deal. The details of it have not been fleshed out yet, but I think it'll be a conversation we'll have in the next one or two years, right? And also given how we respond to COVID. But really my, my, uh, my personal priority will be to transition a lot of our workers into this green new economy, making sure we have a transit system that works for everyone, so it's not just car dependent, and making sure we can get to a sustainable green energy grid, right? So that's going to be talking about how do we transition to having non-corporate energy entities in the state like pg e which i think most of us in northern half of california are customers of and secondly how do we make sure that all the workers of those utilities aren't harmed in that transition right so we have are at this crossroads of immense change right now and we need all of you to be part of this movement and advocating for a green sustainable economy for the future because if we let things go as they are now they're going to keep half compromising with people and letting these people off, but we're going to really be, you know, pressuring everyone at the local, state, and federal level. Thank you. That was a really great um, elucidation of how eco-socialist, like, values such as no corporate money, giving power to the people, can be in our electoral system locally as well. So, um, and I think, uh, does anyone else have, have like, um, answers for um, Olivia's question, why is it difficult to create change from bottom up as opposed to the top down? I think Jessica's answer was pretty good though. Um, money is a big part of it. Um, otherwise, I can move on to my next question. I, I, have, I have a question, or, I mean, a, a response. Um, yeah, hello again, this is Pedro. Um, so I guess one would be why it's difficult to build from the bottom up. I think there's a lot of soft skills that, um, need to be like stressed as an organizer to, you know, address some of the ongoing like social divisions within the community. Because again, it's easy to organize your friends and some of your immediate circle, but really the long-term power building that we need to do is uh, healing our community as well too and creating a solid foundation that will be stable um, during the next pandemic or during the next economic crisis, because that's the kind of power that we need to do um, and established independently from relying on an, um, an electoral system. But I also want to pivot to the question of what elected officials can be doing um, to like, address like environmental pollution and climate change and ultimately eco-socialism. I think one of the things that they need to do fundamentally is take the hard votes and not be afraid of blowback because even progressive um, Candidates, even if they're in office, um, often find themselves weighing, should I take this hard vote and maybe lose office in a year or two? Or should I stay in the long term and maybe compromise and have a longer political career where I can maybe do more? You know, always, always that's one of the biggest frustrations. And then also I think elected officials can um, 
you know, lead and, and not just um, fall back on environmental um, justice organizations or community groups, you know, that they use as fronts for advocacy. Like they absolutely should be prominent as well too and not be falling back on um, other people for cover. I mean, we always work in partnership, that's fine. But I think the dynamic of just using organizations um, to avoid blowback is problematic. And again, shifts a lot of emotional um, and other burdens onto um, advocacy groups. And just Helen, just to add on to this really quickly, um, I think one of the other steps that could be um, taken would be for newly elected officials, officials also would be to fight uh, for electoral reform. So, um, and the way you vote, right, for you people, so you don't have to vote for the lesser of two evils at the same, always, all the time. And then, um, for instance, have ranked choice voting implemented, you know, in, in our current electoral system, proportional representation, just like most developed countries have <laughs> on the planet. And that will allow more diversity, more voices, you know, at the table. And, and that will bring about changes also. And I think the elected officials will feel more supported, right? And more willing uh, to go along those lines and not be afraid to lose votes or, or you know, feeling compelled to compromise all the time. So that would be great. <laughs> yeah, super agree with that. It's a really good system and everyone should look up ranked choice voting if you haven't already. Um, yeah, next question. Who has not been asked a question yet? Hmm. I guess, Jessica, you've technically answered a question, but I want to ask this. Um, you're, I feel like you're my eco-socialism mentor in a way, because I first got introduced to it by you last summer. So um, I read this article where eco-socialism is like, that said, eco-socialism isn't a monolith. Um, eco-socialists disagree on like short-term strategy. And I was wondering, what's your short-term path forward for this, in your opinion? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, there is some like disagreement, uh, I think in general with environmental activists too, of like certain paths we should take and things that we should focus on um, more than others in the short term. Like for example, um, I'll say something that might be a hot take, I don't know, but I don't believe that um, nuclear energy and using, like I don't believe that that's a path forward. Um, like maybe for like the literally right now short term, but um, it's just not a sustainable solution and it's a really potentially dangerous solution when we have other options out there um, that we could use instead um, and invest in instead. Um, but yeah, so I guess one of, I, I honestly, I advocate for this so much um, is the Green New Deal. And I know that that seems really simple simple because we're all here and we all maybe know about it a little bit but I think it's it's something that's so important and for those who maybe haven't taken the time to actually read the 14 pages of it um, it's beautiful in the sense that it doesn't just talk about oh here are some of the potential solutions um, and it is very vague on purpose because it is a resolution not the laws um, those come after, but um, it's beautiful in the sense that it talks about the um, like kind of spiritual like change we have to have the the idea that everyone does have a right to clean air, clean water, um, housing, healthcare, and how those are all intertwined and um, a part of the solution and that recognizing that part um, like has to be part of the answer if we expect to get anywhere. And here's why. Because people have to have something in it for themselves. Um, like people aren't going to care about this Green New Deal when they're working three jobs and they, they can't even make enough to pay rent. They've got kids. Like people have no time to even think about anything, but, but what they're going to, you know, are they going to be able to get enough sleep that night or, you know? Um, so we have to show that we are going to help provide a future in which they thrive, in which everyone thrives in order for people to care about it. And I think that's why the Green New Deal is so important to me um, as an eco-socialist and as an environmental activist, um, because it really shows that path forward uh, in a way that I think if everyone actually um, was able to read it and able to even just see, you know, Cliff's Notes versions of it, um, they could like get it. Like, oh, okay, if this really comes to fruition, I will, I will be taken care of. My basic, my basic needs will be met. 
yeah, okay, that's something I could get on board, on board with. Like, how do we do that? Um, Super. Anyway, that's, that's my path forward. <laughs> for <Yeah>. right <laughs> I think a lot of a really good resource is um, Sunrise School and the Sunrise Movement right now. So we are wrapping up because I'm already so over time. I'm super sorry about that. Thank you all for staying this long. But um, our last question, um, does it pop up on your screen? Or no? Okay, well, it is how can we discuss systemic change? I'll put it in the chat too, because this anonymous attendee asked a very good question. How can we discuss systemic change with um, those around us who may be apathetic to these issues and convince them to join and learn more about the movement? And I want everyone to answer this with probably very, like think about it, short sentences, please. Um, like maybe two to three. So I'll start. I think um, having these conversations one-on-one -on -one and telling your personal story is super duper important because you say why it ma means, like what it means to you, why you care, why this is so urgent, why everything we've known, the normal that we've known is going to, you know, doom all of us in 10 years when it will be irreversible and we have to completely do a massive change at past the level of World War II, past the level of anything we've ever seen before. And it's really important for all of us to get involved. Um, who wants to go next? Um, I'll call Christine. Okay, sorry, it was on mute. Um, no, I agree with you, Helen. We need um, sweeping systemic changes, right? And this is exactly what the Green New Deal is trying to address. And I would just like to, to point out, following up what Jessica was saying, is that social policies are really needed inside the Green New Deal. It's not simply to, to tackle you know, the climate catastrophe, but Medicare for All, which was, by the way, originally in the resolution that AOC campaigned um, on, has been removed, unfortunately, from the, um, the Democrats' you know, Green New Deal. But it's in the Green Party Green New Deal. It is something that is a basic right, right? Other human rights like um, having a roof over your head, um, access to education, right? Even perhaps a universal basic income. I mean, things like this should be included in, in a Green New Deal in order to address the scale of, of you know, the emergency that we're facing today. So um, these, are, these are really needed. And, and I think we can talk to people around us, right? It's just like, I think everybody is affected by the crisis, whether it's economic or, <laughs> or environmental. And, and we can try to guide them by, you know, suggesting um, actions that it can take. And, and I would like to say that one of them is to, for young people especially, to become politically involved um, and perhaps register with a party that they really feel like aligned with their values. I think this is something that this is something that to really get people to change and, 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 and make an impact by telling your representatives, hey, we want something else, right? We're tired of the same old, same old. I think it's time for change. So that would be my recommendations. Thank you. Um, uh, Pedro, would you like to go next? Yes, now that I am muted, I will go. Um, so one thing uh, I would say, you know, to folks who are apathetic is, um, I would be like, hey, have you ever had a dog? Do you ever remember like how much like, with like genuine, like unfiltered, like unfiltered love they look at you? Like, like that's one reason enough to like protect the planet and, you know, care. Um, so like, honestly, like that is my go-to, but also, I think um, we can tie this to like personal stories, we can tie this to, you know, the overall ecosystem, but I really think it's just having that conversation and, you know, shaping the dialogue. If we're not having these conversations, no one else will. Um, and, and, but again, like, I think like, it, it's important. And again, like, at least in the Central Valley, like one issue that we say here is like, we all know someone with asthma, you know? So there's always like a talking point and stuff we can build off of, but we really need to get to know um, the people who we're talking to well enough to figure out where we can build off of as well. Um, but yeah, I would also say again, um, from a conversation yesterday, you ever see a, a cow, a happy cow, like it frolic and jump and stuff, like look that up and see if you want to protect the planet after, like they absolutely deserve it. Thank you. Absolutely. 
Um, Alex, would you like to go next? Yeah, real quick, I'll just say, you know, climate change and the environment affect everything. And we in our generation will have to live through it the longest, unfortunately. So if we want a future that is livable, uh, we're going to have to do everything we can to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. Totally agree. Um, Madeline? Okay, I was going to say something similar to what Pedro said in that you need to know somebody well enough to know what they're going through to know like, what is it that um, this person could really like benefit from if we didn't have to live in a world that is like being destroyed by capitalists and by colonizers. Um, so I think getting to know the person is a really important thing. The other thing that I would say that has helped me so much in organizing people is like you have to build trust, you have to agitate based on like what's wrong, you have to provide a plan of action and some hope and you have to like tell that person why they are needed and why they are needed urgently. Um, and there was something else I was going to say, but I can't remember. Um, oh, a lot of the time that I've seen people be apathetic, like in situations like this is because like people feel demoralized, like there's no hope, like there's no reason why I should get involved because like I've already lost so many times and like it's our job as organizers to provide that hope and that optimism. Thank you. Yeah, hope is a huge part of motivation and sustaining everyone in organizing and I think um, yeah, Jessica, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, I mean, kind of what I was going to say with just already just said, um, I think it is so vital to have, um, you know, hope, but not in like a hope for the sake of hope uh, way, uh, which I don't think any of us are talking about, but just like, they'll just say, oh, you, you can hope for a better future, but actually talking about um, realistically how you can affect that yourself. Um, and even if it's just educating folks, uh, you know, that's that's really important. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, envis envisioning also uh, a future in which we all uh, thrive is really important in that as well. Um, yeah, anyway, I don't have much to add. Everyone kind of said some really amazing things so far. <laughs> um, thank you, Jessica. I think I've hit everyone except Canyon, I believe. Canyon, would you like to finish this off? Um. I tend to interact subjective, uh, like interact uh, subjectively. So I tend to try and align and learn from their value systems. So it's very slow. Uh, so someone who's apathetic, I find I attempt to empathize with them and find why. And when I learn about the root cause, I then can find ways to have conversations in, in bringing that value out because some people may not feel hurt. Some people may have witnessed an unjust judicial system. Some people have seen the corruption um, evolve. Some people just may not even care because they're like, well, by the time devastating things happen, I'm not going to be alive. And so I tend to attempt to align with um, empathy and it's time and it's effort and it's energy, but it's relationship building. And um, Many of my community do similar. They spend a lot of time individually connecting with community to to be present with them. So I have the slow, slow and steady route of empathy and storytelling and integral relationship building to the best of my ability. So I'm not exactly sure what I could say, but it's um, learn from that environment and then strategize together. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all of your responses were so eloquent. I am so, so sorry. We were so pressed for time today. Um, I think my video went a little long um, and my presentation was a little long, but this was an amazing panel. Thank you guys for contributing, even though um, we didn't get to talk super much, but I thought this was really helpful and I really, really hope um, everyone watching learned something. Um, slides are in the description, but we'll send out an email to all RSVPs as well with um, information of all the panelists if they want to contribute anything or and our slides and our recording eventually so um, if you have any last questions please let me know um, I learned so much today and I hope you guys all learn too <laughs> yeah heart thank you thank, thank you, you, thank, you Helen. thank you everyone thank you thank for you. organizing this no problem. I'm thank you guys for being here and um, the presentation was amazing by the way.